is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 120 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Amy Woods all about content marketing and content repurposing. But first, to last week's question, which was, what's your word for 2022? We had stacks of responses, which is awesome. Um, So Janelle Hardacre said, my words are patience, courage, growth, and discomfort. Discomfort. (laughs) I think he said discomfort. Uh, no, definitely discomfort, uh, aka get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I love that. Growth only happens outside your comfort zone. Can't remember who said that, but someone very clever, obviously. Uh, Sophie KB says, confidence is my 2022 word. No more doubting myself or my team or my books. AK Mulford said, we pick a word as a family each year. Oh, I love that. And this year's word is thriving. Oh, I love, I might have to steal that. I love that so much. Erin McKnight said, my word, for, my words for 2022 are purpose. No, my word is purpose. Uh, I want everything I do to have meaning or to be pushing me towards a goal. A.E. Kincaid said, I'm absolutely shit at asking for what I want and need. So this year, my word is ask. I love that. I absolutely love that. Uh, Rachel McWrights says, stability. Brilliant. Yeah, we all need a bit of stability. Uh, Alex Corvo said, I pick a word of the year as well. I like that uh, much more than New Year's resolutions. And my word this year is release. Interesting. A Lemon Life said, continuity. Erin uh, J. Steen said, my theme of the year is recovery. I nearly burned out last year without seeing positive results. I need to take a step back and reduce my stress levels, even if that means I have to lower my expectations. Helena B827, no, sorry, 872 said birth. Interesting. Uh, M. Winkler Books said forgiveness for myself and others because guilting myself into being productive hasn't been working well for me and holding grudges and hatred is a toxic energy I don't want in my life. I completely understand. I have had to go through releasing uh, feelings (laughs) and uh, thoughts and and grudges and things in the past too and it is uh, difficult. Okay, Tessa uh, has... Jarjanto. I hope I said that right. I probably massacred that and I apologise if I did. My word for the year is momentum. I started working on my core, my uh, W-O-T-Y last year and built a foundation. I just have to keep going now and use the momentum to sling me closer to the top of my mountain. I absolutely love that. What fantastic words. Um, I love that they all have meaning and it, yeah, I just, oh, what a what a fantastic bunch of words. So thank you so much uh, for sharing those with me. This week's question is, other than reading and writing, what do you hope to do more of this year? And I ask that very specifically because as a bunch of writers, I am sure we all want to do more reading and writing, but I'm interested in the other stuff. What other things do you want to do more of this year? And uh, one of them for me is to do more strengths training. I have a set of squat rack and weights and bench bench things coming. Uh, actually, some of it's being delivered today. So uh, I'm very excited to start doing that. Okie dokie, the book recommendation of the week this week is The Echo Wife by Sarah Gailey. I uh, read this, buddy read this with uh, Kate, my friend, and uh, it was fantastic. It was very short, uh, less than 300 pages, but it was a sort of uh, genetic thrillery, all about clones and um, there's murder and secrets. And yeah, it was quite pacey towards the end. Lots of twists and turns. I really enjoyed it. Completely not my genre at all. But uh, I think Val actually was the one who told me to read this book. I can't remember why though, (laughs) but I'm pretty sure it was Val who told me to read this book. So it was recommended by somebody else. Um, And it was a completely different genre. And so I thought I would push myself outside my comfort zone and read something a little different. Yes, so I'm definitely recommending it. It was fantastic. Okay, in personal update, right. Well, first of all, I have a bit of an apology. Um, Last week's episode was a bit of a mess. (laughs) 
<laughs> I realised this as I uh, went to open it. I've had a couple of comments about uh, noise levels being off and uh, I think I left a gap in at the back end last week. I can only apologise. Uh, my life has been chaotic the last week. I think you can hear, well, possibly hear in my voice, I am not in peak wellness. Um, it has been a tough week. <laughs> The last week with my wife in lockdown was super tough. Uh, tough for everybody involved, tough for her being trapped in a room for a week, tough for me not having her. Um, I definitely learned how much I lean on her for support. I think that was surprising to me. Um, I don't know why, <laughs> she's my wife, of course I do. But uh, I mean, you know, I just didn't really speak to any adults uh, for that, that week that she was locked in a room. And that has been a bit of a lesson to me that I possibly need to get out of the house a bit more than I have been doing. Um, I also started this year quite frustrated. Um, I don't recall if I mentioned this last week, but I spent obviously the last part of last year trying to finish off lots of projects so that I could start this year fresh on new projects and new things and I didn't manage to do that and so I'm having to finish off a lot of stuff this month and I am very frustrated with that because I wanted the fresh start and I want to be working on things that I want to be working on not doing stuff that I don't want to be doing so I have made a few decisions uh, to cut things out I'm going to have a, uh, a sort of brainstorming session with Chloe this weekend she is going to listen to all of the stuff and things that I'm doing and and command me to stop doing the shit that I don't need to be doing and uh, help me see where I can outsource some more things so I probably am going to invest a bit more in outsourcing just so that I can claw back some more of my time it's a bit scary really because you have to pay out uh, before you have the products and things to to sell and to make money uh, but I'm going to do my best because I want to produce more for you guys as listeners. Um, uh, there are some solo shows that I would like to do, but they take time and, and time is money. Um, and there are some, you know, creative projects that I want to do. I want to be writing more fiction this year. I want to do two non-fiction books uh, this year. Normally I only do one. And in order to do that, I have to cut some shit out. So yeah, this is, it's been a bit of a, and I think having this week, where I was looking after Atlas and and sort of not with Chloe and sort of gave me more time to think and uh, so these are my my reflections I think from from this past week so I definitely want to change some stuff going forward and I will I think give you more information on that once I've had the conversations this week but suffice to say I'm sorry that some of the episodes have been a bit uh <laughs> haphazard the last couple of weeks I am endeavouring to make sure they are uh, more level and there's no mistake I think I left a mistake in last week which I corrected half part way through Wednesday so yes I apologise about that moving on uh, this week I am working on uh, finishing tray um, I'm pulling together a new reader magnet so I know uh, I have spoken about the fact that I want to write young adult um, LGBT books which I will be doing this year that's going to be where I'm focusing my uh, fiction on and I am pulling together a, a, a sort of giant list of book recommendations because it's been bloody hard to find lesbian reads so yeah I'm, it's all very pretty and my VA has done an amazing job I can't claim credit I mean I collected all of the books and did the research but um, she has made it look absolutely stunning so I am very uh, excited to share that with with everybody and that will be uh, for my new mailing list um what else am I working on I uh, yeah so finishing tray um pulling together the anthology getting that done as well um and just finishing off things I've got uh, to finish Brian Meeks's course and do the blurbs for tray and redo them for keepers and victor as well and then um hopefully this month I will get that off and sirens off to the editor so yeah it's all very exciting I can't wait to get this stuff finished so I can dive into new projects Okie dokie, the Rebel of the Week this week is Tim Seabrook. Tim says, a company that I used to work for decided that it would instigate a policy where all smokers would have to stay an extra five minutes per cigarette smoked at the end of the day to make up for the time they weren't working. My core hours were nine until 5.30, though I had been working eight till six for the past two years, up until that announcement, at which point I only worked the core hours. Absolutely, and I think that's because you're a smoker, I'm pretty sure I remember uh, you telling me that you were a smoker so yeah yeah I mean if you were already overworking your hours that seems very harsh of them to do that so yeah I like I like your rebellion a big fuck you to the corporate world I'm always happy for for a, for a corporate fuck you 
Um, if you would like to be Rebel of the Week, please do send in your story. Now, I'm going to do the first one of the year. Please, please do send in your stories. We are low. We are always low. <laughs> we are extra low at the moment. So please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, big, small, or something in between. You can email your Rebel story to Becca on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or, um, no, I'm not going to say that. That's what you can do. <laughs> please email Becca on Rebel Author podcast at gmail.com and then I get to see them live and kicking uh, and you get live reactions from me as I read them out on the show two new patrons this year wowza thank you guys returning patron katie forrest thank you ma oh, i just thank you very much for supporting the show and new patron lovis gaia and i hope i said your your name correctly what a beautiful name you have of course, a gigantic thank you to all of my uh, existing patrons, for everybody who's supported me from the start, from the middle, or whether or not you've joined recently. I really deeply appreciate the support. If you would like to uh, support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content like Rebel Reader Masterclasses, uh, the Slack community group which is just fantastic uh, and poison and pro sessions then you can from as little as two dollars a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash sasha black okay that is it from me today let's get on with the episode Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I am joined by Amy Woods. Amy is an expert in content repurposing and the CEO and founder of Content 10X, a niche creative agency. She helps businesses grow their audience by maximizing the return on the content they create. She works with businesses and brands around the world and is the content repurposing powerhouse behind some of the most well-known podcasts and video shows. Amy is also the host of the Content 10X podcast, and she is the author of best-selling book Content 10X, More Content, Less Time, Maximum Results, The Ultimate Guide to Reaching More People Online with Your Content. Hello and welcome. I have read your book and it is fantastic. So, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. Oh no, well, thank you so much for the intro. Thanks for reading my book and it's a pleasure to be here. So yes, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. So before we dive into our topic, which is like content creation, content repurposing, would you like to tell everyone a little bit like about you, your journey and sort of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure. I guess it's um, not not the most straightforward journey to where I, where I am today. So I graduated from university and had a few jobs to save some money and then went traveling uh traveled in australia and new zealand and places like that and was away for about a year and then came back always wanted my own business but didn't really know what i wanted a business in so ended up getting a, a graduate job with a management consultancy firm which i said was going to be two years and then i'd start my own business but two years became over a decade <laughs> so i just i ended up staying which isn't it which i'm not complaining about is because i enjoyed it um but i always kind of still had that urge that I did want to have my own business but you know things were going okay and I kept thinking I needed some big invention or something like I was just watching things like Dragon's Den thinking come on come up with an invention or a product or something like that but then um then basically, like the long story short is that I had kids, so it was very hard to be a management consultant anymore because it required loads of travel. And um, I had a period of ill health that took me off the hamster wheel of um, corporate life. And during that time when I was off, because I had quite a bit of time off recovering from all operations and things like that, I... Um, it sort of immersed myself in the world of online business and was looking at what kind of business could I have that's some sort of online business. I was, I was kind of, I don't know, discovering people in the online business world like Pat Flynn and Amy Porterfield and Gary Vaynerchuk and people like that. Um, so started a business that was more akin to what I'd been doing as a management consultant, but business consultancy to smaller businesses in an online capacity. So, you know, online uh, consulting and I developed a course and things like that. But uh, my heart wasn't massively in that, but something that I did realize was super important for businesses is content marketing. So I've been learning an awful lot, you know, reading books, listening to podcasts and all of that. And um, I was repurposing my content. I realized to get known and build an audience needed to create content. So I was 
doing these weekly videos that were becoming blog posts and becoming social media content and things like that. And that's when I had the idea uh, to create an agency where we would specialize in repurposing content for uh, businesses. So you create a core piece of content, hand it over to us, and then we'll do all the repurposing and it would save juggling lots of different freelancers and like writers and designers and podcast producers and video editors and things like that. So just have one kind of point of contact. So it just then grew bit by bit. So one by one, you know, just me on my own and one client and then a few more clients, first hire, that kind of thing. So very kind of natural growth. And now um, we're almost in 2022, maybe when this goes out, it is 2022. And um, it's, it'll be the fifth birthday of Content 10X coming up in, in May of 2022. Um, so we've been working with lots of really different and interesting businesses, repurposing their contents, predominantly video creators and podcasters. Um, I've got a podcast of my own where I help people repurpose content. I've been speaking and, um, you know, I wrote the book as well. So a lot has happened in the last four and a half or so years, um, taking me to, yeah, to hear where we are today. <laughs> Amazing. And it is like the content of your book that I would love to talk about. So as you mentioned, yeah. um, you wrote a book called content 10x um so do you want to tell everyone a little bit about the book where they can get it um all of that stuff yeah sure so um it's uh, available in kind of paperback kindle audiobook as well and it's i like to call it the ultimate guide to repurposing any type of content so it's it's not a book that you would necessarily pick up and read, you know, from the start to the end, like a, um, you know, chapter book from start to end. It's more supposed to be that when you have a repurposing challenge or you're looking to repurpose a type of content, you could go to that chapter and then you could look at all the different ideas and, and ways that you could repurpose content. So there's a chapter for example, on if you create video content, how you could repurpose videos and then podcasts and then emails, blog posts, loads on social media, um, even things like if you've done a webinar, if you've delivered a talk, whether it's virtual or in person, um, if you have a membership community. So all the different types of content and it, each chapter kind of explores if this is your core content, then here's um kind of practical I suppose practical hands-on like tips advice and step-by-steps really on how to repurpose the content and it also covers some of the uh, strategy behind repurposing like you know what content repurposing is tools that you could use to help you along the way um, and also um, really kind of um, breaking down the mindset that you need to have as well in repurposing content and how you can spot those opportunities in the first place. So, yeah, I, I, like, I like to call it the the kind of side of desk Bible for people who want to try and maximize the content that they're creating. And I will just say it, it, it genuinely is like fucking jam packed oh, full you. of like all <laughs> like different ideas. Like I, yeah, it, it's all, yeah, like it is so it, it's almost like a step by step. Do this, do this, do this, do this, or like this is an option. This is an option. This is an option. This is an option. So yeah, if you are stuck, then I definitely recommend that you read it. Okay, so let's start with the basics then. Like, what is content marketing, and what are the pr main principles behind repurposing content? Yeah. So, I mean, when we, I guess when we're talking about content marketing, so, you know, there's, there's lots of different types of marketing and marketing ultimately is to, you know, get, get people to notice you, to raise attention and then, and then lead through to, to sales. So when other types of marketing where you're doing kind of Facebook ads or where you're doing pay-per-click advertising on SEO and things like that, um, it's very different to content marketing because content marketing is about, um, putting yourself out there and sharing thoughts and ideas and kind of being helpful with people and having content that will draw people into you. So people will consume your content, get to know more about you, the whole know, like, and trust you. Um, and then through your content will, you know, then hopefully be the right people because you've created content that's really specific for your audience and the people that you want to talk to. So it will draw the right people in, be helpful and useful for them and then ultimately hopefully like lead to conversions and sales so 
you know, content marketing is, you know, sometimes you could say it's a bit of a leap of faith, really, because you are putting this content out there and creating it. But as long as you know your audience and, you know, who you're trying to help, then it's, you know, the best form of content, really, because it is the trust building content that's useful for people. And then, you know, repurposing content is about, you know, taking a message and then looking at how can you communicate that same message in perhaps a different format and perhaps a different location as well in order to reach and connect with more people. So, you know, all forms of content are just a form of communication. So, for example, if you create video content, so you're communicating a message that you want to communicate with people in a video format. But then if you look into repurpose the video, you're really looking to say, I've shared that message in video format, but how could I now share that message in other formats? So we could take the video and firstly repurpose down into shorter video. So repurpose from long form to short form content and share shorter videos of the main video in other places. So let's reach people on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn because the main video was on YouTube. So that kind of thing. But it's also about... um, can we turn this to the written word? So what about people who don't watch videos or certainly don't watch videos where we just publish this? How could we get that message to them? Let's repurpose all the thought that we put into this video and create a blog post instead and put that blog post onto our website or maybe onto Medium or onto LinkedIn or or all the other places that you can publish articles. Or let's turn this into some tweets. Let's really short form it down and turn it into some tweets. Or let's create some visual content or create a, um, you know, an infographic or anything like that. So it's all about, you know, we have a message. We've communicated it in one way and we've shared that in this location. Let's look at how we can take that message and communicate it in a different way and reach other people in different locations. So that's how I view content repurposing and what I see it to be. There's a writer uh, in the community called Harley Christensen and um, they literally do the most amazing things. So every single podcast they listen to, um, they take a quote like on, and literally word by word, like copy out the quote into Twitter. And it's usually the most poignant, most interesting, fascinating quote. And like when you read it, it you like sometimes like I've been quoted or whatever. And I'm like, did I say that? <laughs> that sounds really clever. But like it is it is the ultimate form of like content repurposing because it, it makes it brings a different light on the on the content in a, in a way that I've not seen it before. And it's like my favorite thing. I'm always looking for the, tw- the, the quotes to see like what has come out the of, of, of like episodes that I've listened to that they've listened to as well or whatever so <laughs> um okay right so thinking about content marketing and let's say lots of the listeners like lots of the authors listening uh, want to give it a go what mm. mistakes do you see people making when they try and repurpose content what are the yeah what are the comment most common fuck-ups essentially that people make I guess um I guess one thing would be to uh, I guess, try and over automate things sometimes. So not respecting the platform that you are p- repurposing content onto. Um, in a way, sometimes people, I guess, try and just do a copy and paste approach where um, something, you know, they they post something on one platform and then it's a bit more of a kind of cut and paste over to another platform and that's repurposing. But it's not looking at why people are on different platforms and the kind of content that they want to consume on that platform. Um, and, And instead of putting some thought into that and thinking, well, this is the way that we communicate the message here on this platform because people are here for this reason. But we can't just lift and shift it because when people are on this other platform, they're there for this other reason. So if we want to communicate it, we're just going to have to change the the way, you know, whether it's um, the format or the, the, the type or just the message or the way that you package it up. So one thing I think is just that lift and shift approach. And, and like I said, you can do some automation as well. So there's reposting, you know, where you just repost one piece of content from a social platform to another that that often doesn't doesn't really work like for example if you're going to repurpose content from Instagram automatically to Facebook and it's going to be covered with Instagram hashtags and say link in bio or something that just doesn't make sense on on Facebook Um, and also sometimes 
I don't know, it may be that people do things like a live stream. Um, so let's say a Facebook live stream or YouTube live stream, and um, they're going to repurpose that into a podcast. And, and again, just lift and shift, just take the audio straight out, put that into their podcast host and, and get that out. But it's it's got all those live aspects. It's things like, you know, comment below and, um, you know, we're just waiting for a few more people to join and things like that. And a podcast listener's thinking, what? <laughs> um, so to me, it's things like that. I think um, just being a bit too lift and shifty and a bit too copy and pasty versus actually putting the, the effort into tailor and customize and think about the different places and res- just respect the audience in the different platforms. Mm. So one of the biggest mistakes, I think, is that. And then another thing would be um, not thinking about what you're going to repurpose the content into before you create it so if you go about creating a piece of content but you have a repurposing strategy in mind so you know when you finish this piece of content you're going to repurpose it into these other pieces of content and if you've planned that in advance and you know that then it can make your repurposing a lot easier because you you'll probably structure things a little bit differently and uh, you know I really do recommend that kind of segmenting content and structuring in such a way that when you come to repurpose it afterwards it repurposes like a dream um and just creating things and then afterwards standing back and thinking hmm wonder what I should repurpose this into <laughs> isn't always you know it's not always the most effective strategy so I think you know, there's there's a lot of different things that, that people maybe could do a little bit better, but they would be the two things I'd say, kind of planning in advance to make the repurposing a lot better and just making sure that you have a platform first approach to it, really. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I see lots of things coming from like TikTok to Instagram. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And even I share things from TikTok to Instagram. I mean, I don't really do TikTok, but like if there's a funny thing, I will share it to Instagram. But it really bugs me when I can't click to see the like, oh, my God, it drives me nuts. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I do this, too, or whatever. So, yeah, I yeah, I, I, I why do we not think of these very logical things? <laughs> yeah, you know, oh. the thing with Instagram and TikTok is that um, obviously Instagram reels and TikTok are really similar, almost identical to each other, aren't they? And you, and you can put the same-ish content because it, people are on TikTok very similar to reels. But reels and TikTok, they, the algorithm hates you now because not sure if you've noticed, but it used to be that TikTok, Instagram would say that if there was the TikTok um, kind of watermark thing on it or anything like that, then they'd really diminish your reach because then they're not happy that you're sharing kind of the seconds of TikTok on their platform. So there was tools that you could pop your video in that would like clean it of TikTok watermarks and things like that and still post it there. But that they've got sophisticated enough now that they just know, like there's just something that tells them this was shared on TikTok first. And you'll see a really diminished like reach. And the same on TikTok, if, if it picked up that that had been on Instagram first, the reach will really diminish. So it's funny because it's respecting your audience, but sometimes it, it's annoying to say, but it's also just playing the game and the algorithms will not like you if you are doing that cross posting as well so we we massively see that they know and they don't like it so one of the solutions around that would be to create it outside of both platforms and then upload separately is that the solution yeah exactly yeah 100 yeah. percent. Um, yeah okay how do you know what to repurpose so i think that well, I mean, firstly, I I always think that you should have a repurposing hat on because I think a lot of things can be repurposed. But in terms of having a content strategy and trying to work out, you know, what within my content strategy should I try and regularly repurpose? I always think it should be your kind of longest form pillar content. So your your longer form like this, like a, like a, a nice kind of long. A podcast episode that is your core pillar content or videos or long longer blog posts that you do every week versus maybe short LinkedIn posts or something like that but the pillar content that you put you know a lot of time into 
Um, I think that it's about the return on investment from the time that you're putting into things. So if you're putting a lot of time into these core pillar pieces of content, they're the things that I think you should really look to repurpose because you want to maximize that time. And there's going to be lots of gold in there because you're putting that much time into it. These are your, um, you know, your golden content, I guess. So I would say that also they'll be the meatiest as well because there'll be lots in them, like lots, lots to take out, lots of short form content coming from the long form. So to start with, it's really good to have these core pillar, maybe once a week piece of content. If people can manage that or once every two weeks or whatever, once a month, if it needs to be, but making them the best that, that they can possibly be and then getting that return on investment from that. So that's, that's where I would start. If I was devising a strategy, I'd say always look for the biggest piece first and then look at how you can break that down. Okay. Mm. Um, so I want to turn to thinking a little bit about, um, authors because that is the primary audience of um my listeners so how do you because there's two sides to this non-fiction authors I think have always had an easier time creating and doing content marketing because we're solving problems therefore we can take solutions out of our books or we can take connected or you know side connected problems and solve those in podcasts or or courses or or tweets or whatever to, to attract our audiences but it's not you're not solving a problem with fiction so um I just wondered like how can um authors approach like fiction authors approach content marketing like yeah any tips or advice for for fiction authors yeah I think it's really really um, challenging like you said in comparison to non-fiction isn't it because I've been I've, I was thinking about this with my book and thinking about the repurposing but that it's not a fiction book but I was just thinking what's translatable um so some of the repurposing that I did I have the audio book so I was looking at how I could repurpose the audio content from the book um so as a podcaster, and I know not everybody who is listening, you, you might not have a podcast and it's not the most common thing in the world, but as a podcaster, I repurposed a, you know, the first uh, chapter, I think it was all part of the first chapter of my book as a podcast episode. So one thing was to look at an existing, you know, content avenue that I already had, which was an audio format, which was a podcast that had an audio book. So repurpose just enough that that you're allowed before you know you sign certain rights don't you of how much can be shared in another place before you get in trouble so whatever that percentage was but um I, you know like something like that in terms of I guess looking at the different formats so for audio I did that not everyone's going to have a podcast um but one thing you can do is if you do have an audio book create audiograms as well so taking the audiograms are where it's a snippet of audio, usually paired with a, you know, a, a static image and often an animated audio wave that allows you to play audio content on the social platform. So sharing an audio snippet on Instagram or Facebook or um, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. I do think that could be an option for um, anyone who has an audio book to look at like, like great little snippets, some really you know, like tease aspects of the book or a funny bit or something that would stand alone and someone would listen and think, hmm, <laughs> like, I really want to hear more of that. that. That's got me, that's got me hooked. So if you have audio, I think, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you agree, but you may be able to take little snippets and create audiograms and share snippets of audio on social. Have you? Is that something that you've done before? Or? I've done that for my nonfiction. So I did my first yeah. audio book uh, on my first uh, fiction book this year, and I did create some little excerpts, but I don't have audio for my fiction. Um, but yeah, I think equally, if somebody does have, like I'm thinking a few of my friends who have audio books for their fiction and they definitely could do that. I think some of them even have done it. Um, but yes, that is definitely a cool option if you do have audio. I think the problem is the vast majority of authors still don't have audio. Like it's, yeah. even though we're seeing double digit growth, like year on year on year in audio, it's still so new. Like I think one of the things about indie authors is we're so, like we think that we're slow or behind the times, but we're actually really, 
really quite far advanced in a lot of yeah. um, like areas in the industry. And so we take for granted things that, you know, maybe we've been doing for three years that actually most people are still like, for example, my wife, I've been listening to audiobooks for I can't even tell you how many years. My wife <laughs> only only recently is like, I think I want to try an audiobook. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, yes, you do want to try an audiobook. They're brilliant. Like, of course you do. Um yeah. but yeah, yeah. Same here. Um okay. Think, sorry. Oh, oh sorry, I was just gonna say that just a few like other ideas for that. So um other looking at other other assets that you have, so things I did. So visual content from the book. So I would again, it's a, it's a bit of a challenging one for fiction authors actually, because I was going to say that what we did was we took just photographs of sections of the book, you know, just like the chapter opening and things like that, and created some visual content that we shared on Instagram. Again, just teasers, but like lots of different types of visual content. Now, you can't, there's only so many you can take at the front cover, but I mean, we took like, we took um, images of some sentences from the book and some, like I said, chapter openings and things like that, but just teasers and things to intrigue people and things like that. So there's, there's that visual content along with like a good caption, you know, sharing that image on some of the visual platforms and then, you know, explaining in the caption what this is, what this about and things like that. Um, other things, of course, is when you get the book, book reviews coming in. So you, repurposing those book reviews. So making sure that you take uh, screenshots of them, making sure that you get, you know, kind of images of them, maybe creating your own branded look and feel for how you share book reviews and that social proof and then repurposing those book reviews and that social proof out into social media as well so you know we were finding trying to find creative ways to to share these reviews and the social proof and um, not just down to kind of sharing them singularly but things like creating a carousel post so like a you know a flick through carousel post of a carousel of all the recent reviews of the book um or instagram stories of the book or you know things like that but also if you're on twitter and um, twitter threads do really well at the moment so don't just like tweet out one review but do a, a thread of the, the different things that people have recently been saying about your book and kind of create an interesting line or thread so again looking at what's working on the platforms but we we were trying to look at the different things that you can do with the book because again for a non-fiction one it was also a bit more straightforward to repurpose aspects of some of the chapters into blog posts and things like that so um you know some of the chapter but not all of it um and and get that onto our website i know that doesn't work standing alone with like fiction books you're not going to just kind of turn a, a chapter of a, of, of a fiction book into a blog post but um we were trying to look at the other things as well, like, right, we've got book reviews, we can create some visual content and just be creative with that, like selecting, you know, you know, on Twitter, on Instagram, people share tweets, which is just sharing the tweet, like the words that were said, we were finding that just sharing some words in a visual on some of the visual platforms did work, you know, and it, and it was useful to do that. Um, so it was more around the assets that we have related to the book as well as the book itself. And so the assets with the audio book, the um, reviews, you know, taking visuals and graphics and things like that and extracting uh, aspects of the book for blogs and, and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, I, do, I do appreciate it. It's quite a challenging one because my main experience is with the fiction and uh, with the nonfiction. <laughs> one of the things that I have seen... Um people do recently is they'll put their book in the middle of a colored piece of paper and then in big yeah. marker pen they like write all of the different tropes so they'll be like oh fated mates or enemies to lovers this book has a blah blah you know stuck in a snowstorm or whatever and like I'm seeing loads of authors do that and that like is another like so even if you're not repurposing the the very specific words from your book um I am seeing authors like 
repurpose the concepts or the feelings or yes. the emotions in their books. Um, yeah. And the other thing that you can do, like not all authors do this, but some authors write author notes in the back of their books. Mm. And sometimes they're really funny or sometimes they're really heartfelt. And that's like another thing that you can pull out of your book that isn't necessarily um, like the content. Um what was the other yeah. thing I was going to say? Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, that was it. So and um, you mentioned about like social proof and reviews. Without exception, the best Facebook ad that ever targeted me was a one star review that an author had gone, right, bitches. Like she pulled out this one star review and gone was a one click buy for me. And I was like, yeah, baby, it's a one click buy for me too. <laughs> like, it's just, just amazing. Like I'm not sure if I have the uh, the balls to do that. But um, yeah, I, I loved that. I thought that was a great way to repurpose and like be a big sort of oh, key yeah. to the one star reviews. <laughs> Yeah, there was, um, it, it, I've seen a few things like that of, um, you know, instead of being utterly let down and feeling deflated with something like that, just make, you know, make fun of it. And um, uh, I've seen a couple of those in in real life. For example, there was something recently that had like a, a bar that had a plaque outside that said something like, come inside and see what trot one trip advisor person said was the worst burger they'd ever tried in their entire life or something like that. And then people <laughs> were coming in to see is it similar, but um, but also um you the behind the scenes, like you mentioned, like author notes and things like that. Like it's kind of like the behind the scenes aspects of how the book came to be, isn't it? And how the book came to life. And I think that's also great content to it to be thinking about and maybe this is what I was saying about thinking about these things before you embark on the the big piece of content as well as what could you repurpose into and what other content could you get from it and so definitely um it's not so much repurposing the end product of the book but you know taking people on the journey with you is a, is a big thing as well isn't it if you can be sharing behind the scenes content as the as the book is coming together if you're willing to do that and sharing um the progress or um, whatever you're comfortable in sharing content in whatever format but there's all different ways to share that behind the scenes mm. and then also when you have the book always having it on you so that you can take photographs of, of the book in interesting places as well and interesting people holding it because um when I launched my book just like when I did a pre-launch I went to this this um big podcasting event in the US and I, I just everyone that I met who I just knew other people might know of or they have an audience or things like that and people are just new anyway I was just making sure I got a photo of so many people holding my book it sounds that cheesy but then I had loads of content then of just rather than just sharing the book it was like here's so and so with the book so and so loves the book da, 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 and just sharing all these photographs of people with the book as well um so having it with you at all times because you never know who you might see that you could photograph holding your book or where you where it could be but I think behind the scenes is um content and taking people on a journey with you to it being released can work really really well as well yeah the last thing that I thought of whilst you were talking is thinking about what your readers want so like for example um I'm moving into writing young adult like kind of contemporary romance but specifically LGBT and mm. I know that in my research, one of the things I found really hard is finding book recommendations, finding any bloody books in this genre, because it's so underserved as a market. And so one of the things that I plan to do is to give book recommendations, create lists or like here's a load of young adult lesbian books that are fantasy or contemporary or romance or mm. you know blah 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 because I know that I was looking for that information and couldn't find it so other people will be looking for it and if I can you know casually slip my book in as one of the recommendations <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know then it's like buy my book without buying my book um yeah so okay um one of the things that I think is really important is building audience now of course like you can just slap out content slap out content slap out content but how do you actually use content repurposing to build an aud an engaged audience yeah I think um one thing is to try not to be everywhere and make sure that you don't get kind of too carried away with the possibilities of repurposing content to the point that you are spreading yourself too thin and trying to be absolutely everywhere instead of more just 
focusing on where your audience are because if you're trying to build that audience that engaged audience then you really need to uh, make sure that you are engaging with them (laughs) so you need to make sure that you are engaging with the audience you know engagement is a two-way thing isn't it so you want to build an engaged audience you need to make sure that you're there and engaging with them and I think that if you spread yourself a bit too thin across lots of different social platforms firstly of course you must focus on where your audience are so it's not about being everywhere it's just about being where you know they are so even if you know he's reading all this uh, advice and people are saying you must be on tiktok or you must be wherever um if your audience aren't there then there's no point in you being there so just making sure that you don't get carried away with that kind of guidance and forget who you're talking to and then I think it's about the amount of time that you have and how much time you can commit to engaging and again if you spread yourself too thin there's going to be some platforms that you may be not as present on as others so from a social like from a social media perspective I think building an engaged audience is about being where they are and having enough time to engage and speak to people and respond and very importantly to be paying attention to what people are responding to and going more all in on that so it's it's like it's like constant uh like consumer research as well really isn't it because you can keep kind of drilling down on the things that people are responding to and realizing the things that aren't resonating with people and just always being open and aware to seeing those patterns and making sure that you're not being um, too strict with maybe a strategy that you set out on that there's feedback coming along all the time saying that maybe it's time to change or deviate or do something different but I think the other thing is um, which is really important is consistency so to build an engaged audience kind of back to the question of how do you do that I think you need to be really consistent I think you need to be consistent with your messaging so you know who you are and what you want to become known for because it's quite hard to grow an audience if you're very scattergun with your messaging and if you know even if you have people who are aware of you and some people are following you but if somebody said to them you know what did they do or, or what do you know them for and they couldn't really answer that question it was a bit like oh, I don't know really <laughs> like sometimes they talk about this but then I don't know maybe they're more about that and you couldn't really say and then that's hard to kind of gain any traction if you're not becoming known for anything and people aren't going to mention your name um in passing because there's no specific thing that they know you for um but also the consistency of turning up like with me and my content I've had a weekly podcast and I've just been so consistent with making sure that I turn up every single week and you know I've got I've got that I got that advice from people who I really admired who had big followings that said that consistency was key to them as well and that if you think about the the top tv shows not so much these days because we tend to all watch on demand on Netflix and Amazon Prime and everything like that but you know when we would you know religiously look forward to that program that was on at nine every Monday or something like that and you'd feel let down if I certain weeks it was like randomly not on for some reason it's like really annoying and if that happened too often eventually you just kind of forget about it move on and find another best show and it's a bit like that really it's you know being consistent and consistently turning up so I, I think it's it's more important to find a content rhythm that works for you to make sure that there's something new that's regularly coming out from a content marketing perspective, you know, maybe ideally once a week that people will know where and when it comes out and you can start growing a following over there and you can repurpose that content coming back to the first question on what should you repurpose. And I was saying, I think it should be like your core pillar content that you look at first, but just being consistent in messaging and where you show up and when is really key to actually building and growing an audience. Yeah, I I resonate with that so much because like I know that on a Monday morning on the school run, I've got two podcasts that come out. I listen, you know, like, well, one sort of on the way there and on the way back. And by the time I've made my coffee and finished faffing and sat down, the podcast is done. And then I listen to the other one on the way to collect my son in the afternoon. And like, it's the same on a Thursday and a Wednesday. And I know exactly what podcast. And I tell you what, I rage, rage (laughs) if they are not (laughs) 
not out because they're part of my life and you integrate them like into yeah. certain habits or routines or yeah okay so um probably my last big question um you mentioned there um oh and I can't quite remember the wording that you used but like essentially looking at like how how the bits of content are working and how they're performing and stuff so like yeah is it really just likes you know, or comments, like what are the most effective metrics to track? Or how do you know if your content is performing the way that you want it to? Like how do you assess if your repurposing is working? Yeah, I know it's such an important question because you're spending time on this and you want to to know that it's working. And I think it really does come down as well to what your intentions are and what you ultimately want to achieve from the content. So it's not just likes really. I mean, that's all in a way, kind of vanity metrics, but it depends on, so what do you want from the content? So yes, engagement is really important, seeing that people are engaging and resonating and commenting and, uh, you know, sharing as well from a social media perspective. And then other types of content that you're creating. So any data that you can get hold of is super important. So you've got a podcast, so you could get hold from your podcast host of the download statistics and look at all the episodes and the downloads. If you focus on video, you could be going and looking at your video views. If you focused on, um, uh, like we said, like social, look at all the different social channels and manage to kind of pull off likes and comments and engagement statistics and things like that. But I feel like that only shows part of it of course the other part is um is are people getting in touch with you as well like it, it, it what are you, you know are you receiving emails are you receive you're a business are you receiving inquiries is your business is your business growing as a result from a content marketing business perspective most of the time it's to grow your business and to be creating content to become known so aside from all of that are those inquiries coming in and and are you getting more sales as well? Or perhaps it's more from a relationship perspective. So um, we have clients who the core content is is the podcast and really what they want to do is um, become more known in their industry as a thought leader. Um, And is that happening? Well, they would say yes, because I've started to get invited to speak at these events Mm -hmm. in the industry, speaking at events even in other countries in the industry, because people have seen on LinkedIn that I've got this podcast and that I talk about these things. They were looking for a speaker. They've asked me to speak. Also, we've got business from the podcast because the people who we interviewed went on to become our clients or people saw that we were associated with these people that we interviewed and became a bit more interested in us as business and got in touch with us and things like that. So the bottom line was not likes, shares and comments, but sales, like actually like clients and business growth and things like that. And it it can be quite hard to directly pin some of that back mm. to a specific piece of content. Um, so then it becomes more just that, like over time, having the patience and seeing that over time, you know, since you started going all in on this content and creating it and sharing it in different places, what, what are you starting to see is happening and what what's that feeling that you're getting that you are becoming more known? Be, being invited on other people's podcasts. I don't think I got invited onto other people's podcasts until I had a podcast of my own, which we then were putting out there and blogging about and repurposing. And then suddenly I'm invited on other people's podcasts. And then like when we first started uh, the show before we hit record, you'd heard me on somebody else's podcast and you bought my book. <laughs> so like, and I, I was on that person's podcast because I think we both spoke at an event. And I think that we spoke at that event because the person who um, ran that event um, had, had uh, I can't remember, like there was something content related there, like had been on his podcast or something like that. And, you know, it's like, until you start putting yourself out there, um, I don't think you can always realize just what's going to happen and all the opportunities that are going to come your way. So mm-hmm. I think when you're looking at the measures of success, it from each individual platform, of course, you do need to be paying attention and looking at things like, does anybody care about this? Are they liking, are they commenting? But you do also need to just think of other things like, 
um, have I started to see that I'm invited on to other people's podcasts? Have I started to see that a few more people have started buying my book? Have I started to see that I got invited to speak at events? And ultimately, have I started to see if I'm running a business that there's more sales coming about over a period of time when all of this activity is happening? So having a more like a rounded view of the things that you want to look at and measure, which isn't necessarily just those I would often say if you have more kind of vanity measures, if they're not not if they're not doing anything to any of those other things, they're really just vanity measures. And if your only goal is to grow on social media, great. But if your goal is to use social media as a device to actually um, impact other aspects of your business, you've got to look at the impacts and, and, and not so much as those statistics, if that makes sense. Yeah. So makes- yeah. <laughs> It makes total sense. And like, I was sort of laughing as you were, as you were talking because like podcast statistics are notoriously unreliable. Like my yeah. host says I've like had X downloads, but then like when I went to like say Spotify and I got like my annual from Spotify, the amount of downloads on Spotify alone were like double what my podcast host said I'd had on really? Spotify. Yeah, so I was like... Mm what this is this is these are so unbloody reliable it's ridiculous like so I have no yeah. idea how many downloads I've had you know I know I all I can go on is a conservative figure from that from the host but um yeah yeah like you can't you just can't rely on the vanity metrics because you know yeah. they're not always reliable then you know and they're not they're only showing you like one one tiny thing which is really heavily affected by algorithms anyway um exactly so yeah, yeah I love that I love that Okay, well, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Oh, yikes. Um, when I unleashed my inner rebel, does is this specific to... Um, it can be anything. Uh, kind of... <laughs> it can be anything. I have had all kinds of stories. I've had legal stories, illegal stories. I've had childhood stories. I've had stories, yeah, I've had stories from university, from parties, from, from all kinds of things. So any rebellion. God, oh, you know, you know what? I I'm just like one of those people who can I can go through life getting in trouble because I get really mad when I want to stand up for something that I think is, is a bit of an injustice. And I um went at my old uh, job at Accenture I think I was quite well known for doing career limiting type things where I just stood up for um stood up for things that I felt were a real injustice <laughs> and I, I I remember one you know particular time I had a boss that um that was uh just really really kind of bullying like more junior people in in the organization and was really making a mess of, of this account that we were on and um I, and I, I organized a meeting with like kind of her boss, like my boss's boss, a really kind of senior person and and had this meeting where I just explained uh, all the things that were going on, you know, that, that these things were happening. And it was right at the time that I was due for a promotion as well. So it was, it was the stupidest thing to, to ever do because like, you know, <laughs> go into your boss's boss when your boss makes the decision on promotions and telling on them basically and saying that they've been, you know, doing all of these things, all these people are very unhappy and, you know, really bad stuff. Um, and I thought that I was the hero, though, that that she'd get removed off the account. And, and the things that she did were so appalling. I really did think that they would, like, have, have like, disciplined her or something. But it was like the, the complete opposite actually happened because um, because they didn't do anything because, uh, because I guess even though she was not behaving, you know, very well toward the human, she was bringing in money, so it was kind of ignored. And um, and I, but I got called into a meeting where I thought I was going to be like, sort of, I don't know, paraded as the hero, you know, and and like that this would be the outcome. And it was like it was an ambush. Basically, it was her and the boss who I'd complained to, and someone else like just laying down to me, like oh, how you know this may be the case, but <laughs> but this is the this is the uh, you know the outcome, and, and you you know, and I didn't get promoted as well. And I, and I, I look back, and I think it's really funny because people said to me, you know surely you knew just even booking that meeting was career limiting and you weren't going to get your promotion. But I think, I don't know, it's, I just, it, I get really, really principled. Like even when I was at school, 
at primary school, I was always the one that ran a petition. I remember petitioning for girls to be able to wear trousers um, for all of my primary school life. And I also petitioned for a girls football team for all of my primary school. And now all the girls can play football. But when I was at school, there was no girls football team and girls couldn't wear trousers. I was even in like the local paper for like girl petitions for like school to let your girls wear trousers. And, and like it never had, never, my rebellions never seemed to work. But now whenever I see a girl wearing trousers or a hair of girls football team, I'm like, yes, <laughs> there we go. That, oh, I think that's amazing. And I think you should be so proud as well, because like, if it's not if if there weren't people like you in the world we would still be stuck you know with schools where girls can't wear sk- um can't, can't wear trousers and things and like yeah uh, I uh like I have to try and like calm down and not allow the steam to blow out of my ears because I think that's fucking outrageous that they didn't do anything about that, no. that manager like but this is like this is why I did not get on in, in corporate life because I, I laughed a little bit when you were telling your your story I applied to be in Accenture and I'm so glad that I didn't get in um mm-hmm. I did get on a graduate fast track scheme and I hated it six months in I was like clinically depressed and like really miserable and I ended up there for eight years trying to work my way out uh, in into my own creative business where I could be my own boss and it was exactly the same thing like I was told that I didn't play the game um oh what, no. how come you don't change your personality like depending on what meeting you're in because I'm the same human <laughs> yeah, because I'm a human being yeah <laughs> like, why would I do that um, you know yeah. and things like oh your personality is a risk to your reputation yes darling it's the best part of me you know like well, I can I can say yeah. that now but like then I was crushed by things like that um oh so, yeah. yeah, like well, I love that. Rebellion. You live and you learn, don't you? And then, and then you you find the right thing for you, and and never look back. <laughs> exactly, I completely agree. Okay, yeah. well, tell everyone where they can find out more about you, your books, your services, anything else you would like to add. Yeah, of course. So to just find out, you know, anything more about all of that, um, if you just go to content10x.com, so it's content and then a one zero x.com, and everything is over there. I'll oh, thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a giant thank you to all of the show's listeners and the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Amy Woods. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Kelly Track, and we are talking all about how to find your inner genius. And it is a lovely, inspirational, kind of philosophical uh, episode and yeah it was it was fantastic talking to Kelly so I hope you will join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher and when you have a moment please leave a review.